Hello and welcome to Nightcast. My name is Jonathan Reyes, Knights of Columbus Senior Vice President for Communications and Strategic Partnerships. And I'll be your host here at the St. John Paul II National Shrine in Washington, D.C. Here on Nightcast, we hope to help you step into the breach as men, as Catholics, and as Knights. You can find all episodes of Nightcast by visiting koc.org slash nightcast and on the Knights of Columbus YouTube channel. In this episode, we'll be talking to the Supreme Knight about his recent trip to Rome. We'll also have a special conversation with Curtis Martin, the founder of the Fellowship of Catholic University Students, or FOCUS, on the prospects and challenges facing young Catholic men. We'll hear from a Catholic chaplain for the Washington Nationals and much more. Thank you for joining us on Nightcast. The Supreme Knight recently visited a new resource center for the homeless in Rome that was opened with the support of the Knights. Let's take a look at the important work it is doing in the Eternal City. Thank you very much for welcoming here to this beautiful center. We're so grateful for the invitation. Il nostro principio era di creare un luogo bello, pulito, di qualità, dove eh, le persone senza fissa dimora possono passare il loro tempo in qualche modo per sentirsi parte di nuovo di qualcosa. Il nostro rapporto con i Cavalieri di Colombo è nato, che sarà, due anni fa. Quindi è stato un rapporto dove il quale subito ci siamo sentiti in sintonia. I Cavalieri di Colombo sono stati un punto cruciale per partire con questo progetto. Senza l'aiuto dei Cavalieri di Colombo sarebbe stato tutto molto più difficile ma Our Lord Jesus Christ has told us that and we must see his face the face of Christ in one another and this is really what it means to be a disciple of Christ The Knights of Columbus were founded 140 years ago for just such a purpose so we could encounter one another and we could take care of one another I'm now joined by Supreme Knight Patrick Kelly. Mr. Kelly, thank you again for being here. Hi, Jonathan. It's great to be with you. So, Mr. Kelly, at the end of last month, you had the opportunity to be in Rome, and you did a number of important things there. Perhaps one of the most important is you and Archbishop Laurie were able to have a meeting with the Holy Father. I wonder if you can tell us something about that meeting. Yeah, we did. We met with the Holy Father, and uh, it was a very, very good meeting. Uh, we reported to him on the activities of the Knights of Columbus over the course of the past year, the charitable work that we have undertaken, the work in Ukraine. Uh, we talked with him about uh, Father McGivney. Uh, and I, I have to say, the Pope was very, very supportive of all that we are doing. And I think he appreciates the Knights of Columbus uh, because of, of, of what we do to support the church and to support the needy. Uh, at one point, the Holy Father talked about uh, the need for co-responsibility for the church, for the, for the laity and the clergy to work together to build up the church. So I think he sees that in the Knights of Columbus. He sees that, that we are in solidarity with our bishops and priests and that we are an organization, a group of men and families really committed uh, to helping the church in every way. Uh, were you able to take an opportunity to share some of our new initiatives, some of the things we're doing around faith and men's formation? Yeah, I did. I, I talked with him specifically about uh, this, this turn that we have made to really trying to form men as husbands and fathers. I talked with him about the core meeting the, the, that, that we've undertaken. And he really, he really uh, was very, very encouraging of that. I think this very much fits in with uh, one of the themes of his pontificate in, in, is sharing the joy of the gospel. And I think he sees the Knights of Columbus as uh, a, a lay partner with the, this great work of the church to really build up the church. You were also over there, though, to receive an award on behalf of the Knights of Columbus. I wonder if you might tell us a bit about what that award is, and then we can talk about what you said there. Yeah, so this, uh, this was an award given at the North American College Annual Dinner. It's called the Rector's Award. The, the rector of the North American College gives the award. And I was given this on behalf of the Knights of Columbus uh, to, to, for all the work that the Knights have done over the years uh, to support the North American College in terms of 
seminarians that we have supported through through scholarships, uh, but also just the, the 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 building projects and just the support that the Knights have given the college that goes back uh, uh, more than half a century. So the Knights of Columbus have a long history with the North American College and kind of a special history through a particular individual. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about that. Yeah, that individual you're mentioning uh, is Count Enrico Galeazzi. And he was the Knights of Columbus representative in Rome uh, in, in the middle of the 20th century. And he was a Renaissance man of sorts. He did many, many things in addition to representing the Knights of Columbus. Um, he was an architect by training, and he was he worked with the North American College to acquire the land on the Janiculum Hill where the college is today. And he was an, the architect who actually designed the building. So his history and the history of the Knights of Columbus is very, very much uh, entwined uh, with the North American College. Now, interestingly, his his grandson is a man by the name of Enrico De Mayo, and Enrico presently is our representative, uh, the KFC representative in Rome. So there's this very interesting uh, family history there. So we have this historic connection uh, to the college, but we also have, I think, a, a, a more a spiritual connection in the sense that there are uh, seminarians studying there. And uh, what I was able to do was talk to them about Blessed Michael McGivney and the priestly ministry of Father McGivney. He saw his parishioners struggling. He saw the families in his parish struggling. And he, he wanted to help them. So he devised the Knights of Columbus. And that was the message I gave to the, the seminarians also to everyone else who was there, that the importance of this, of, of a priest really serving uh, his people with the heart of a father. If I could switch gears, let me ask you about something else we've talked about in a previous episode, which is about our strategic plan, where the Knights are going. It's a plan that has sort of a 10-year horizon and like a one-year horizon. So it's both long distance and close. I just want to ask you, how are we doing with our strategic plan? What, how's it going? Are we meeting the goals we've set for ourselves? I am so uh, enthused about our strategic plan. One of the things I mentioned earlier was about, about the core meeting and about, about what we're doing with faith formation. That's going very, very well. We're, we're moving that ball. Um, one, of our, one of the pillars of our plan is creating a premier digital experience that's moving along very well. So I, on all these fronts, we're making very, very good progress. And I'm very, I'm very excited about, uh, about what we're doing there. Let me just ask the basic question. How are we doing in inviting men to come join us? You know what? Uh, we're having a very, very good year. Uh, we're, we, we, our membership growth is up over last year. We just uh, hit a milestone, really. We just went over... 100,000 online members. And uh, as everyone who's listening knows, the online membership program has been, has been going for five or six years now. So to hit 100,000 members is a, is a real milestone. But it's really, really encouraging to me that we, have, we, we are doing so well on membership. And I think, I get the sense that we are in a post-COVID world, men want to be with their brothers. They want the community and the fraternity. They see the value of what the Knights of Columbus brings to their parish and brings to each of their lives personally through, through the personal witness of faith and the personal witness of charity. And I think, I think men are seeing that and they're joining. And uh, uh, really, it's, uh, it, it's, it's really uh, an exciting time. Well, that's very encouraging. And once again, Mr. Kelly, thank you as always for taking the time to be with us here on Nightcast, and we'll talk to you again on the next episode. Thank you very much, Jonathan. I'm now joined by Curtis Martin, founder and CEO of Focus, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. Curtis, thanks for taking time to be here today. Hey, Jonathan, great to be with you. Always a delight to spend some time with you. We were together not too long ago in the eternal city of Rome, so great to be back with you. Oh, it's great. I'm sorry to interrupt your reading there. I, I couldn't help but notice what you had in front of you. 
every day, every day. <laughs> like a good night. No, it's great to see you, Curtis. Thanks for doing this. I We've been struggling to make this happen because we're trying to get our schedules to align. I'm so glad it's worked this time. Hey, let me start with some really interesting news. So you've just been appointed to a new diecastery in Rome. I wonder if you could just tell us a bit about that. I, it's a tremendous honor. Congratulations. Thanks so much. I'm one of two Americans, as far as I understand, who've been appointed as a consultor to Pope Francis in the Dicastery for Evangelization, which is a brand new gathering of energies. The Vatican had three or four groups that were working on evangelization, new evangelization. The Holy Father has brought them together. He is a small group of consultors, uh, and I was honored to be an inaugural member of the previous iteration on new evangelization by Pope Benedict, and now uh, the, the, to be an inaugural member of this new one by Pope Francis. Do you know what this, the duties are going to be yet? Have you been like briefed on this, or is it something you go over there and you find out? So the Holy Father would like me to spend an hour with him every morning. No, I'm just kidding. They, uh, it's, a, it's a great delight. I will be invited uh, on from time to time to be able to go over to Rome to speak both with the Pope, but also uh, with the, uh, the dicastery and the leaders there will be gathered. And so we're waiting to hear exactly what the schedule will be. But in addition to that, Jonathan, one of the things I'm most excited about is really in some ways I've been told this is a kind of a badge of support from the Holy Father for our work here in the United States and Western Europe as we expand to Mexico and other places in the world to be able to sit back and say, the Holy Father is supportive of the work of focus. That should be an encouragement for you in your work. And that is a tremendous thing because I really believe this appointment has very little to do with me personally and a great deal to do with the hundreds and hundreds of people that I work with full time within focus. Now, let's talk about that a little more, what Focus does. But first, full disclosure, so that my audience knows I, you and I have worked together for many years. I worked for you at Focus, and I now sit on your board. That being said, tell me, uh, why did you find Focus for any of our members who maybe don't know what Focus is, and then bring us up to date on all the great things you're doing? And I just want to be honest, it's not that really that we work together within Focus. You worked near me. I sat around doing very little, and... Uh, so, no, we did work together, and I'd like to thank you, even though we, uh, now you're doing this great work with the Knights, we're still working together. Uh, a great thing. So Focus is an organization that exists in order to evangelize the world. And so we are primarily a campus ministry, working with young adults on college campuses. We have uh, hundreds and hundreds, almost a thousand full-time missionaries serving college campuses, mostly in the United States, some in Western Europe, and now in to Mexico. And the way that we work is we take recent college graduates, we train them and equip them, and then send them back out as, on teams to be able to serve the universities, to engage college students. It's been fun to watch. We started with two part-time staff to have 1,000 full-time staff. We started with about 20 students. We now have tens of thousands of students, tens of thousands of alumni, and it's been amazing to watch. Uh, over 1,000 of the young people we work with are now pursuing religious vocations. Uh, it's just been tremendous to see that I really believe our testimony is the Catholic Church works. We just have to trust it and really live the Catholic life. And when we do, amazing things happen. I know you're seeing the same thing in the nice, Jonathan. Yeah. And focus, some people just think it's a campus ministry. But as you were just saying, it's bigger than that. What are some of the other things you're doing? Yeah, we started a beta about four years ago. So a beta test into parishes. We've got about two dozen parishes. We're also working directly with dioceses. We've got about four dioceses we're working with and many thousands of people now involved with the parish and the diocese. And so we're doing essentially the same thing in a different context. And we want to be very aware that, we're, that the context changed. But I would say the difference between Benedictine College and Harvard, which are two of our campuses, that's also a big context change as well. And so we're learning how to, uh, how to apply this method that we really believe Jesus shared with us in his words, but even more in his actions in the Gospels, to be able to reach people not only so that they would come to faith, which is essential, which is necessary, but that they would come to faith and then they would come to fruitfulness so that they not only would follow Christ, but they would actually lead others to do the same. And as you do that, you start off an exponential growth pattern where you pick the number, but five become 25, 25 become 125, 125 become 525. And you start to see this snowball of faith. And that's exactly what we've seen now. We, as we looked at our work over the last 25 years, it's our anniversary this year, uh, we believe that we can show clear evidence that we've reached over a million people so far using this model. You've been also doing mission work. Now, where does that fit into the focus plan? Great question. And thank you. And I know you know a bunch about this. So we had some people come to us and said, hey, what if we went on an alternative spring break? Took a group of athletes down the Dominican Republic, college athletes, and they did a baseball camp for young students in the Dominican Republic. 
And so we started doing mission trips, taking college students during Christmas, spring break, and during the summer and sending them to first, second, and third world locations. The the folks that are on mission trip, uh, it's kind of fun. They they are coming and they understand we're a Catholic program. They hand us their cell phone, no cell phone for the time they're there, no social media. Uh, there's every day they're at mass every day. They're at a holy hour. And then they're spending time with the folks they are serving the poor and they're serving them in whatever needs they have. Uh, we work, we only go and we can work with other Catholic organizations that are already on the ground, serving people in their needs. So we now have become, we've been told, I don't know this to be true. We've been told the largest mission sending organization in North America, sending thousands of missionaries into first, second, and third world locations on an annual basis. And what we've seen is the college students go, and Jonathan, when they go, and you know this because you were here, when they come back, they've they've been changed. When they meet Christ in the poor, they realize that as first world people, they, they live a life that is filled with luxury and they've taken it for granted. And now all of a sudden they want to live differently. When they live life, sometimes without a cell phone for the first time in 10 years, these are 18 year olds. Uh, they all of a sudden realize the, all the temptations on cell phone. I got to get away from that. And we're seeing life changing experiences because of the mission trip. Now, this is all the activity you're doing, and it's great. And it seems to me Focus can do all kinds of activity. But the real secret of Focus and its potency comes from a vision for sharing the gospel and sharing the gospel in a way that anyone can do so that they can then learn how to share the gospel to others. I wonder if you could just. You have certain principles I know in focus for sharing the gospel and then actual practical training. I wonder if you could just tell us a bit about what's the secret to making this big, scary word evangelization doable by anybody. I would say we practice a a three-step process that can be broken down into simple words, win, build, and send. We want to win people into friendship, both with ourselves, but also, more importantly, with Christ. We want to build them up in their knowledge and the practice of the faith, and they want to send them out so they can win other people. This starts the snowball. But I think the first step uh, before we do any of that is that before you can win anybody else, you have to be one yourself. So the first step is, are we living in intimacy with Jesus Christ? Have we realized that uh, living for him and with him is the most important thing in life? I like to use the example that uh, we as Catholics know so well, the calling of St. Peter Peter's a fisherman. Uh, he, he's working away. Jesus one morning comes over and says, can I stand in your boat and teach the people? And he goes, sure, whatever. He's washing his nets. And then as he, at the end, he says, can we go out into the deep and, and, and fish? And Peter's like, you know, yeah, I'm, at least in my mind, he's thinking, well, you're a carpenter. I, I've been fishing all night, didn't catch anything. I don't, why would I do that? But I'll do it. They go out and catch the biggest catch of Peter's life. A professional fisherman, best catch. And at that moment, he does what I would never have done. What I would have done is said, hey, Jesus, let's go into partnership. Uh, let's fish. What he says is, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. And Peter says, no, From uh, Jesus says, from now on, you will be catching men. And he quits his job. Jesus, all of a sudden, in one day, becomes the most important thing in Peter's life. And we want to recognize that whether it's Peter or it's Jonathan Reyes or Curtis Martin, Jesus Christ wants to make himself that real to every single person on earth in every generation. That's the win. Oh my goodness, you are the Lord and I want to follow you. From that place, our missionaries are then able to live a life of sacramental life and a life of prayer that is the foundation stone to go out and win and build and send others, but you can't give what you don't have. And so it's really important that we allow God to give to us first. And you train it just practically, like here's how you tell the story of your own conversion. Here is how you strike up a conversation. And these have proven to be very translatable skills. They're working in the parish and other venues. They do. And I think that you know, one of the things that changed in the 25 years is that we all know this. I mean, when you think about it, uh, there were fathers and mothers sitting around campfires thousands of years ago. Mom and dad are illiterate. They don't know how to read, but they're still sharing stories with their children and their grandchildren. And that stories are captivating the hearts of people. Well, we as Catholics have access to the greatest stories in the history of the world. They had even in Goliath, Moses and the Red Sea, Jesus and the resurrection. And as we learn these stories and we begin to share them, well, we can teach people how to do that. But it really is amazing. It's teaching people how to tell these stories. It's a little bit like teaching fish how to swim. 
we were made for this. And so it's really, it's, it's quite simple. As one of our priests said, Curtis, this isn't rocket science. No, not at all. It's the opposite of rocket science. There are very few people who are rocket scientists. Everybody's called to be a saint. And part of that is just living and then sharing the amazing adventure that Jesus Christ invites us to. As, as you and I were there last week in Rome, to be able to, to be at the footsteps of St. Paul outside the wall, the Apostle Paul buried there at St. Peter's in Rome, the Apostle Peter buried there. Unbelievable adventures. If these guys had not gone on adventures, no one would ever have heard of them. They wouldn't, they wouldn't know who they are. These men changed the world because they entered into an adventure at the invitation of Jesus Christ. You and I believe, and I know that many, many nights believe, Jesus Christ is inviting people into that kind of life-changing experience. Be a world changer, or what the church calls, be a saint. The invitation has never been more open and never more available than it is right now. You know, Curtis, I want to pick up on something you just said that I think is really important. You talked about handing on the faith, passing it to our children. You use that as a way of talking about evangelization. And one of the things that Focus has become quite knowledgeable about is actually dealing with young adults and younger people. And one of the things that we worry about a lot in the nights and are certainly paying attention to is young men. And I wonder if you can just share some of the things that Focus is learning about dealing with young men, evangelizing young men, forming young men, what they need. Uh, you've got, you're all over on campuses. You talk to young, you yourself talk to young men all over the world. What are some insights in dealing with the young men who've been formed by today's culture? Many years ago, I was a young man. So, no, I, I speak as a, a longtime third degree knight, two brother knights, uh, grateful to the Knights of Columbus. I would say that what we share in common now focuses a men's and a women's program side by side on college campuses and now in parishes. But all our formation, our small group formation is all men with men and women with women. And, and so I had a long conversation with you, Jonathan, to be able to sit back and talk about the great insights the Knights have. And I think the insights that God is now giving to focus about this. And uh, I really think that. Both the Knights and hopefully Focus are positioned right now at this time in history to be an extraordinary asset because I really do believe, uh, as we've taught, masculinity is not something you grow into. It's something that's imparted to you by the other men in your life, your father, your older brothers, your friends, and to be able to recognize that. And that's why a fraternal organization, the best in the world fraternal organization, the Knights of Columbus, is so perfectly positioned. We're a small, small organization compared to that, but we were working with young men. And I would see this as a way, a way of encouragement to the Knights. It's never been more effective, more fruit, fruitful than it is right now. We will hire more missionaries this year than ever before. We will add more campuses than ever before. We have more students involved in our program than ever before. We are hiring more men than ever before. The issue is, is that I think we have to recognize the culture is, uh, is grinding men to a powder. There are two massive false understandings of men. One is that they're macho and you're going to blow stuff up and break stuff and you're strong, but you have no control. And the other one is that you're a wimp and that you're, you're, that you're easy to mock because you're not very smart. And, and th those are both lies from hell. The reality of the matter is, is that men are called to be great. Now, they have to become great and they need other men in their lives to do so. And that's the key. In our program on campus of men working with men, we sent a male missionary out, actually a couple of them, and they start to work with a group of men, and they're investing in life. But on a very practical level, they don't get together and say, hey, let's get together and pray and go to the sacraments. We're going to get there, and we do. It is, let's go play ultimate frisbee. Let's go grab a pizza. Let's go on a hike. Uh, we find the things that they want to do that are moral, and we do those things. We find the things that we love. And we invite them to do that. And this is really imitating St. John Paul. As a young priest, he'd take young people hiking and fishing and kayaking. Go live life. This life is meant to be amazing. And in the midst of those friendships, now the time comes to talk and then to begin to practice prayer, learning about Christ, about the, chief, the, the church's teachings, to be able to see this is amazing. Within that framework, I mean, the young people that the young father Waitiwa invested in were in a great part, responsible for the fall of the Iron Curtain. This is not something we do to make us nice and pleasant. This is something that Jesus did, that St. John Paul did, that you and I are supposed to do to change the world. The, the, I love the book of Acts. It says, these men have turned the world upside down. And I believe we live in a world that needs to be flipped right again. It's been turned upside in the wrong way. Let's turn it back so that we have families led by husbands and fathers 
who are great brothers to one another and love their sons and their daughters and are willing to be faithful as Catholics in the midst of a culture that doesn't understand Christ, doesn't understand the church, and they're in the name of pleasure and of happiness, they're making themselves so miserable that they need to choose a different course. We have the answer. The answer has always been the same. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He is the answer to every one of life's questions. We need to be men who live that answer so we can share that answer. You bring up fathers. What can we say about fathers? A couple of things. This is sort of the culmination of the male personality is to be father, whether spiritual father or spiritual and physical father. Focus is invested in this. You've also produced a lot of fathers or at least helped a lot of fathers, whether they've been priests. Tell me a bit about what you do in your formation that thinks about this and some of the things that Focus has been able to achieve for both natural fathers and spiritual fathers. Well, Jonathan, I think it's important to walk back just for a moment and sit back and, and, and bring a teaching that you brought to Focus. And that is that as a young man, uh, you learn, first of all, what it means to be a son. It's the first relationship we know to be a son. And then as you grow, you learn how to be a brother. And we won't go there right now, but it, that's a portion that's just gone in our society. If you have brothers and sisters, they live in different rooms and have their own social media, you don't share life. The average Italian today doesn't have a brother, doesn't have a sister, and doesn't have a first cousin. They're only children of only children. They have no lived experience of what it means to be a brother. And, and, and brotherhood's an important step in that because in brotherhood, as we know, you look at somebody and say, I want to punch you in the face. And then you say, if you punch them in the face, I will punch you. You'll defend them. I'm so angry, and yet I love you more than anything. And that has to be a lived experience. You don't learn that in theory. And to learn, and the other thing is, when you learn how to love as a brother or a sister, you learn how to love people in a non-sexual way. Because the next relationship is that of husband. In our culture, we've removed the brotherhood. And so all love needs to be open to being sexual, which is a horrible devastation to what it means to love. So the next step is to be a husband, which then leads to the ultimate, as you said, fatherhood, which will repeat the cycle. Now you'll raise sons. And to be able to sit back and say, fatherhood is in crisis, and that's not all bad news. In some ways, all earthly fathers are designed to fail because we're only pointing towards the heavenly father. But we don't have to fail horrendously. We can try really hard and do a great job. We'll still fall short. The expectations on a father and any child is amazing. I always like to share, I have a relationship with my mailman, but I don't get devastated when he's late with my mail. Whereas my father, I had a great earthly father, may he rest in peace, but the little things he didn't do well actually really got to me because my expectations were so high. God put that in us so that we could lead and then at the same time point towards our heavenly father. That being said, we need in the midst of this culture and the Knights of Columbus are positioned more than anybody else, I believe, to actually be able to facilitate this. We need a renewal of earthly fathers in a dramatic way. I would argue the biggest change, and Jonathan, you know this, the biggest change in the last 25 years in the young people we serve is that they are living the reality of broken families and broken homes and the, and the woundedness of that in a way that, that was not the case 25 years ago. It was bad 25 years ago. It is the story today, and it leads to all the issues with regards to misunderstanding of, of gender and all of the big controversies today. But a lot of us, I just don't know who I am or how to love. And in the midst of not knowing, I'm desperate for love and identity, and I don't have the true North Star of Jesus Christ in the Catholic Church. All of that can be restored by a dad who, even in the midst of his weakness, loves and gets involved in his children's lives. You know, I'm sure you hear this. I hear it when I speak. You probably hear it way more than I do. Inevitably, someone comes up to you and says, you know, I did everything right. You know, they're an older person. I did everything right. None of my kids or three of my kids are not practicing the faith. What encouragement do you give to them? Well, first of all, it's never over. And uh, we don't know the journey. At a certain point in time, Mary Magdalene looked like she was a train wreck, but she is St. Mary Magdalene. And uh, don't give up. And I, I, we love to share, St. Augustine actually talks about this in his confessions. He talks, his confessions is the book about his coming to faith in Christ. And as he tells the story about his mother, Monica, and we know parts of the story, but he tells the story in a way that uh, when you read it, it's actually amazing. There's, there's four ingredients that, that Augustine highlights. Monica cried. 
most people know that. Monica prayed. Most people knew that. Monica actually gave alms. Um, and, and, and Augustine will actually highlight that and say that was it. So prayer, and then she also fasted. And to be able to understand this is the recipe. And I think a lot of people are um, heartbroken and sad that family members are away. But are we weeping? And I don't mean um, occasional tear. I mean weeping. Uh, by way of analogy, they say that after Peter denied Jesus three times, he cried so hard that there were crevices in his cheeks from the tears. Uh, I'm talking about weeping. Do you realize that eternal son? We don't want to be Pollyanna. Oh, yeah, they're certainly going to come back. Uh, but we don't want to be despairing. We need to pray and pray hard. We need to weep and weep hard. We need to fast and fast hard. And we need to give alms. We need to care for the poor. The church's teaching is that when you care for the poor, this flows right from Jesus' words, you're caring for him. The, the way that the saints talked about it is, in some ways, God comes into debt to you when you care for his poor. And so you want him to answer your prayers? Care for the poor. And so this powerful reality, we'll see that. And the other piece of it is, are you just going to Mass on Sunday? Or is the faith something that is the center of your life and gives you joy? Because if you're not a lot of fun to hang out with, I don't want what you have. If the faith is not bringing the fruits of the Spirit, which St. Paul outlines in Galatians chapter 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, if those things aren't part of your life, you're not attractive. Uh, you've got to put the best things in life on the hook if you want to bait the hook effectively. And that's what the, the faith is all about. And moms and dads can do that. And the best moms and dads certainly do. Uh, the reality of the matter is, John, just to be true, true confessions, in the last, I don't know, four months, I've been blessed with nine children. Uh, most of them are grown. We still have three at home. But my older children have come to me. I, I've worked hopefully hard and hopefully well, but I've worked a lot. Uh, trying to build and found focus. And each of my older children came to me in, in different tones and said, we're grateful for what you did. We understand how big focus is, but we would like the attention that you gave to focus. Now, some of them were pretty angry and some of them were were much sweeter, but, but each of them gave me a message within the last six months to say, we need you. And it's been a time in my life and working with my wife, Michael Ann, to repent and say, I'm not trying to walk away from focus at all. I believe I still have a role to play. But there was a time maybe 15 years ago where if I wasn't at focus, it would not have worked. Now we've got hundreds of great staff. I can step back in certain ways and make time for my children and my grandchildren, our ninth is on the way, and invest in them. And to be able to listen, you know what? I, you're right. And I'm sorry. And focus wasn't more important than you, and it wasn't even more urgent than you. But I want to use this time of my life to make reparation for not being as available as I could have been. And maybe there's a lot of nights out there have been busy building your career and doing important things and good things, but there's nothing more important than your children, your grandchildren. Whatever business you work for, I'd like to think focus is a big deal. Jonathan works for the Knights of Columbus. It's a big deal. But a billion B, a billion years from now, nobody will know about focus or the Knights but you will know about your family. It's the most important thing we're doing, man. It's the most important thing. Amen to that. You know, you bring something to the table, Curtis, as focus, but also personally that I think is so important for the church to hear. So I'm just going to tee this one up and let you run. The urgency of preaching the gospel. You've just said it about our children, but you've said it about this generation is responsible for the spiritual life of this generation, right? And Amen. And I think we've got to comment on this because there's this sense like, well, the church over time can get its act together, or I over time can get my act together, or the church is, or the, the culture is just so bad right now, let's hope it's better later. But right now is the time to act. And I, I just want to open it up for you to comment on that because it's, it's something that you've always lived, but you've also been able to share so effectively. Well, you're very kind, and I appreciate the softball pitch. We like to say, as you said, this generation of believers is responsible for this generation. And it's based upon some simple truths that we already agree on. First of all, we believe that heaven and hell are the only things that really matter. If you come to me a thousand years from now and say, hey, when I was on earth, I drove a Ferrari, I lived in a mansion, and I look at you and you're on fire because you're in hell, I'm going to look at you and say, you're a total loser, cosmic failure. Uh, nothing you did on earth matters at all to offset what a miserable wretch you will be for the rest of eternity. And by way of comparison, if you didn't nail it here on earth with the earthly things and the treasures, but you die and go to heaven, you win. 
And so that's the first piece. The second piece is we don't believe in reincarnation. So every person has one life, and you get to, to find and, and, and come to acknowledge and love and serve Jesus Christ in this life. So for those of us who already know him, we should take those two realities and say, we must work with urgency. I would argue not, not with uh, craziness, not with haste. There's a method modeled by Jesus of investing in a few. You know, his model was crazy. He found 12 men and went camping for three years. That was his strategy to reach the world. And he did a pretty good job within a couple hundred years. It was amazing. Within one generation, there were people in every nation known to, to man that were already believers in Jesus Christ. This is an effective mode to be able to, to raise up not just believers, but disciples who don't just acknowledge Jesus as God, but follow him and invite others to do the same. And to have this sense of urgency, because in 100 years, or let's say 150, every single man, woman, and child on earth today will be gone and will have been replaced by other men, women, and children. So we have to have this sense of urgency and to be able to commit to this. And this is where the Knights are uniquely positioned, maybe more than any other institution within the church in the world. Two million members, unbelievable males who are ready to serve and are already serving powerfully and to recognize, in addition to the incredible corporal works of mercy that are being done, extraordinary caring for the poor, that those spiritual works of mercy, of sharing the gospel, of teaching the faith, those things are important. They're actually more important because the soul's more important than the body. It's absolutely essential. We have to care for the poor and feed them and clothe them and, and take care of their physical needs. But we're, we're a composition of body and soul, and the only way your body lives forever is if your soul does. And so the spiritual works of mercy are amazing because when you feed somebody, they get hungry the next day. When you evangelize them, they can live forever. And so to have that priority of both and, but the spiritual comes first in a level of, uh, of importance and to be able to recognize we can do this. And what we watch, Jonathan, through focus, and we, we fail more times than we succeed. Like many uh, great baseball players, you, you swing at the ball more times than you hit it. If you have a 400 batting average in Major League Baseball, you will go to the Hall of Fame. That's four out of 10. That's a failure rate. And, and by the way, you get many swings every time you go, you, you're go. you at bat. If you walk, the, the bat doesn't even count. I mean, it's crazy how many times you fail. And if you had batted 400, you'd be in the Hall of Fame, guaranteed. And so recognize we might fail, but as we execute on this, the success is absolutely amazing. The numbers are great. I don't care about the numbers. Each of the numbers is a story of a soul. And to be able to watch primarily young people because of our work, but now we're working with people of all ages, but to watch a young person who was dead in sin, living for themselves, listening to the culture, and doing all the things that Christ would say not to do, and all of a sudden they realize that Jesus Christ loves them, wants to forgive them, and they turn their life around, that story is so extraordinary, and it shoots right into eternity. And I know that that's the heart of the leadership of the Knights of Columbus. I know that's the heart of focus. And so we're very grateful uh, for everything you do. I say that as, a, as a, somebody who works at focus and has been a long time Knight uh, and uh, looking to you, somebody who used to work at focus and now is one of the leaders of the Knights. It's an honor to be with you. Curtis, thank you so much for your words and for the time and for the encouragement, man. And, and God bless you. And I hope to get to see you soon. All right. God bless. Working with Catholic Athletes for Christ, the Knights of Columbus supports an important ministry, bringing Mass to major league ballparks throughout the country. One such ballpark is Nationals Park, home to the Washington Nationals. Let's take a closer look at the Catholic chaplains who carry out this important work. The schedule for Major League Baseball is incredibly tight. The ability for players to find churches, especially when they're on the road, is incredibly difficult. So through this ministry, we've been able to bring the Mass into the stadium. To have the connection with baseball involved and be able to go to Mass and celebrate the liturgy um, and celebrate the Eucharist is something that is so unique to CAC. 
layers get a little cut off from a lot of the things that normal people have access to. And so to have priests available specifically for them who are aware of their setting and their circumstances and are available for what they need would make it a little easier for them to nurture their faith and deal with whatever circumstances they're dealing with as human beings as well as players. My name is Father Andrew Fisher. I'm a priest of the Diocese of Arlington, Virginia, and I've been honored for the last 13 years to be a part of Catholic Athletes for Christ and a priest here helping with the Washington Nationals. Baseball has always been a part of my life. I had the honor of pitching for four years Division I college baseball. Sports is an incredible bridge, a language and a culture, and it is an extra tool that I can use to help share the good news of Jesus Christ with others. It's great to get to know priests and monsignors within our church outside of just that mass. I got to know Father Fisher going to the masses at Nats Park. And as I was dating my now wife, I was able to give her RCIA classes and then confirm her in this church. He's definitely near and dear in our heart and has been very fruitful in our marriage. I've been a chaplain probably, what, about 13, 14 years now, I think. One thing I've noticed is that the players and coaches and staff, they're very welcoming to me, whether they're Catholic or not. They chat with me, they'll ask for blessings. When it comes time for blessing bats, everyone pulls their bat out, whether they're Catholic or not, wants me to bless their bat. So I find that the players especially, they're, they're excited and happy to see a Catholic priest, regardless of their faith background. We are a small but fervent mass community. We have coaches, we have players, we have staff. Uh, anyone in the in the building who wants to come is welcome to celebrate with us, and it's it's small but fervent, and I and I and I enjoy it. We've learned to be better, no matter where I'm at, no matter where my family's at, no matter where anybody's at. That during consecration, the communion of faith, we are celebrating having everyone together at mass is something that helps me recenter. Monsignor Rossetti's ministry will always be important to me and important to everyone at Nationals Park, knowing that we have a familiar face coming back and knowing that we have our confessor there that we want. The support of the Knights of Columbus and what they do, you know, on a daily basis for all parishes, including CAC, is instrumental in allowing us to worship and hopefully portray that to the rest of the world that we can live out our faith uh, amongst a tough profession in professional baseball. We have more than 60 priests across the country who celebrate Mass for our players and coaches and team personnel. And without the support of the Knights of Columbus, it would be almost impossible for us to continue our Mass ministries, where we bring the sacraments to the players, coaches, and team personnel. As a knight and as a chaplain to a Knights Council, I see the wisdom of Father McGivney's vision every day. I always think back to the Gospel where Jesus told the apostles, Leave your nets and I will make you fishers of men. I certainly learned baseball and loved baseball. God did not ask me to give that up and that's one of the joys of being a chaplain here with CAC, that my knowledge and experience of sports, God uses it now to bring the gospel to others. I'm now joined by Father Andrew Fisher of the Diocese of Arlington, Virginia and one of the chaplains for the Washington Nationals. Father, we appreciate you being here. Thanks for taking the time. Dr. Ray, it's great to be with you today. Great. So a lot to talk about. What has sports revealed to you or being engaged in sports, both as an athlete, now as a chaplain, dealing with at the highest level of sports? How does sports relate to faith? How does faith relate to sports? How do you see those two speaking to one another and frankly, being at the service of one another? Dr. Ray, I, I got to tell you, when I graduated from college and uh, entered the seminary, I kind of wondered why did I have all these years and success in sports and now it's gone? But it was amazing as a seminarian and as a young priest that sports is actually a tool of evangelization, that it's a common language, that when I gave talks or spoke with people, they understood metaphors from sports or examples of sports. It was also interesting for people that perhaps would never sit down and talk to a Catholic priest they would be happy to go see a ball game with me or with the youth group, and I could go to people's homes and talk about their favorite sports teams, and suddenly doors open. So it came to me that it's like Jesus told the apostles, don't stop being fishermen, but let me use those gifts now in a new way. I'll make you fishers of men. And for, for me and for others who really had learned lessons of, from sports, 
don't give them away, give them to God, and he'll use them. And so many of the lessons I learned about teamwork, perseverance, not giving up, courage, uh, priorities, those things I did as an athlete transferred very well to the spiritual life and even to my priesthood. And also when I talk to husbands and fathers, the same. So the faith of athletes is not something you hear a lot about, and that's understandable, but you've seen faith in this space, in this professional space. I wonder if you could just say, what's it mean to have mass in a stadium? What's it mean for players to have access to a priest, uh, even if they're not Catholic? Uh, what in general have you sort of learned about the importance of faith in this space? When I was first contacted about 15 years ago by Catholic Athletes for Christ that oversees the uh, uh, spiritual ministries to professional athletes, but also to athletes at every level, grade school, high school, college, minor leagues. Their mission is to provide for the spiritual needs of, of all athletes. Uh, for 15 years, I've had the honor of saying mass for the Washington Nationals. And it's incredible because these, these players and coaches and staff, they're real people. They have the same struggles everyone else does. And they are constantly on travel. They're constantly under pressure. They have a really demanding schedule. They will play in three cities in one week. And the one constant they have in their busy and crazy life is the faith that wherever they go for weekend games, they know in advance where the mass will be, what time will be. And many of the players have said they look forward to Sunday because that mass, that gathering of Catholics, both the home team and the visiting team, it's a little spiritual oasis for them. It's the piece of stability and purpose in a, a week that's a roller coaster. And at Mass, it's beautiful when the players will do the readings at Mass. Some of them will be altar servers. And for many of the players, it's also a chance for Mass, confession, ask questions. Uh, at the Mass has also allowed me to help with marriage preparation, baptismal preparation, RCI class. And some of the players traveling can bring their families. It's beautiful to see them with their wives and children there. In fact, uh, one player a couple of years ago brought his wife and kids. And after mass, he said, Father, I know my kids will remember me as a father playing on the field, but I want them to remember that their dad was a mass with them on Sundays too. And I thought, what a beautiful testimony of faith that although he wears a uniform and is on TV, he knows his vocation is to be a holy husband and father first. And he did that even as a baseball player. You are in a space that most people don't associate with faith. You're also a pastor of a church. And when most people look at the big picture or just look at the news, it's what's happening to faith in America, et cetera, et cetera. And yet you've seen and radiate so much hope because you see the power of the gospel. I wonder if you could end our interview by talking to our brother Knights about the signs of hope you see in the work you're doing. Absolutely. Uh, you will see a baseball player on the field for perhaps two to two and a half hours. You don't realize behind the scenes the other work that goes on. And the same is true in a parish. We have a lot of Knights of Columbus in my parish. I have a beautiful council, and they are the backbone. And for every big success in the parish, for every wedding, baptism, for every new event we're doing, every ministry we have, it's you don't see behind the scenes good men of faith and good families of faith that roll up their sleeves and use teamwork and courage to do it. Blessed Michael McGivney was born in Waterbury, Connecticut, and died in Thomaston, Connecticut, where he served as a parish priest. On a special train ride, pilgrims rode from Waterbury to Thomaston to hold mass on the very site where Father McGivney's parish once stood and where he died. Let's take a look at this unique pilgrimage. Father McGivney was born in Waterbury. His parents were immigrants from Ireland, and they met in Waterbury. All support him down there. I'm looking at it right over there beyond all the people where those taller trees are. That's where the church was. That's where Father McGivney celebrated his masses when he was here from 1884 to 1890. And it's here where he took his last breath. 
in the rectory in 1890. So the idea came to mind. Let's go from Father McGivney's birthplace in Waterbury to his death place here in, in, in Thomaston. It's a historic day celebrating mass on the very spot where Father McGivney celebrated mass. I, I gotta say personally, it's probably among the one of the greatest days of my life. Just being here celebrating mass as a priest on this very holy ground. I'm holding, of course, a, a relic of Father McGivney. It would be the first time that his body has been in this place since 1890. Seven years ago, my younger sister, Sister Veronica, wanted to find the spot where Father McGivney celebrated Mass and where he died. And so she went to the zoning office here in Thomaston, and they determined that right here where our altar is right now. So Father McGivney took his last breath right in this spot over here. These railroad tracks were here when Father McGivney was here. It's just so fantastic what it means to Thomaston that one of our you know, pastors would become a saint. I mean, that is a tremendous opportunity for that. We're just so happy and pleased. We have a lot of parishioners that have family members that knew him, grandfathers and great grandmothers and ancestors that had him as, as their pastor. It's a historical area. It's a historical uh, uh, moment in time here with uh, Blessed McGivney, you know, being blessed in our lifetime. How, how great is that? And then what a privilege to be serving in the territory that he served and passed away. This was sort of a little mini pilgrimage, but it reminds us not only the way Father McGivney walked and rode, <laughs> but the way that all of us are called to walk in the journey of our life. And ultimately that's the way to Jesus Christ. And that's what today was all about. And I have the privilege to preach here today. I'm almost in tears. Preaching on the very spot where he preached. Father McGivney took these tracks. But more importantly than anything else, he showed us the way, the road that leads to our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm now joined by Father Jim Sullivan, rector of the Basilica of the Immaculate Conception, and like Father McGivney, a native of Waterbury, Connecticut. Thank you for joining us, Father. It's great to see you. Oh, it's great to be with you. Thank you so much. Well, this is such a great thing to talk about, Father McGivney. And your story is just amazing. And this, the history of Father McGivney with your personal life, but also with your family in general, is pretty outstanding. So I wonder if you just take a minute recount why Father McGivney means so much to your family, and then we'll talk about your vocation. Well, I guess it goes back to my childhood days. Uh, I went to Providence College, uh, Dominicans taught, and my uncle was one of the Dominican friars there. And my uncle and my mom, who, they were both, the whole family was born right near Father McGivney's house, essentially right across the river and, you know, a little drive of the golf club and they, you could have hit each other's houses. So at Providence College, when he was there, I was a freshman and joined the Knights of Columbus. My uncle, a number of years before that, in the early 1970s, he essentially resurrected a, a defunct council from five men to 550 men. It was, it was just amazing. If you were at Providence College and you were a man, a young man, you were essentially in the Knights of Columbus. So, and so I just say from after those Providence College days, still stayed involved with the Knights. And well, I, the love grew over the years. I have a sister who's in the Sisters of Life, who has a great passion for Father McGivney. And I think the two of us just sort of grew together, along with my mom, my sister, my brothers. And here we are. Now I'm just pinching myself to actually being the rector in, in his home parish in Waterbury, Connecticut. It's just, it's, a, it's an amazing full circle. Now you would, your mother and you would pray at the tomb of Father McGivney, the McGivney family. When did that start? How did that develop? That started many years ago. And I was just curious as to where he was born, uh, where he was laid to rest, rather. And... I had actually been there when I was 21, 22 years old. I was in Providence College just graduating. And in 1982, I had the privilege of serving the mass of the movement of his body from Waterbury to New Haven, of myself and uh, six other Providence College students, never realizing one day I would become a priest, never realizing one day I would be the pastor. So I think my mom, because she had a devotion and a love for Father McGivney, just felt the call to, to visit there frequently. And I had been doing it for about 25 years. You have a rather remarkable vocation story. I wonder if you could just tell us, when did you know you were supposed to be a priest or that the Lord was calling you to be a priest? 
And when did you say yes to that? <laughs> At 51 years old. <laughs> Hard to believe. So I, I, my brother and I, spur of the moment, we were both graduated from Providence College, never thinking we would start a contracting business. And spur of the moment, we did. And it, it, I guess it slowly grew. And we did it for 25 years. My brother's still running the company, in fact. But after 25 years, the, the, it was always in the back of my mind. And I actually belonged to the parish in Thomaston at the time where, where Father McGivney died in, in, in Thomaston, and I bought a house up that way. And so my affection for him over the years just continued to grow. So I say my vocation, I think, is in many ways attributed to, to Father McGivney and, and, and my love for him over the years. And thank you, God, for this calling. I tell people I knew I would love being a priest, but I didn't know I would love it this much. But for those who are called, it really is a, a, a very beautiful calling as it was for Father McGivney in his day. As a priest, you've had some pretty neat experiences, two of which I just want to ask you about. We just saw a video earlier on the show about a pilgrimage that you led, and you were able to say Mass right there, where Father McGivney would have said Mass, right near where he died and passed away, and you were at the Beatification Mass. So these are two moments. I just want to ask you, what was it like to be at part of those two events? It, well, yeah, I'm pinching myself. It, 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 both both were amazing. But to be at the Beatification Mass, not only were we there, <laughs> we were in the front row. And just before Father McGivney's Beatification, we, I invited all the parishioners to write prayers. And we bought them bags of prayers hidden under our chasuble and alb. <laughs> Myself and Monsignor Bevins, who was the rector here for, for 24 years. So we carried all these prayers sort of uh, against our heart, really, into the beatification. So that was one of the beautiful moments of my life, just, just to be there, uh, as well as at the, when his relics were um, uh, taken from New Haven uh, the months previous, and also the mass in Thomaston at, at, his, uh, at his burial place. So what would it mean if by God's grace he's canonized coming up? What would that mean for you? I know it would mean a lot for me, but you're closer. What would it mean for you? Well, I'm now over 60 years old, but somehow I'd learn how to do a cartwheel. <laughs> it was, it was, and, and along with the entire parish. There is a great love for Father McGivney here. What will it mean for Waterbury? I, I, what will it mean for beyond Waterbury? What will it mean for the Knights of Columbus, for, for the diocesan priesthood, for the American priest? God only knows where that will go. And so I think if he's, if he's canonized a saint, oh my goodness, I just have a feeling Waterbury, New Haven, Thomas, and all of us will just become a, a place where, let's call it mini miracles will happen, maybe big ones too. But certainly there, there'll be, a, I think, a growth in the church. What's my understanding that Waterbury at one time was the most Catholic city in the United States per capita. Obviously Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, all these, Baltimore, all these cities were, of course, many more Catholics. But it was here in Waterbury that it was, I grew up thinking there was only one religion. <laughs> There were so many, so many churches. We had 10 grade schools. We had four high schools, all Catholic. And it was just an amazing center for faith. And I have a feeling it's going to happen again. And that hopefulness, I think we all have to live with that, that divine hope, supernatural virtue of confident expectation that there's going to be change and growth. We're made for that. And I have a feeling by Father McGivney's inspiration in this area and in this parish and beyond, I, I truly believe it's going to happen. Thank you to Father Jim Sullivan for joining us to explore the life and legacy of Blessed Michael McGivney. To learn more about Father McGivney, you can visit fathermcgivney.org. On April 14, 1945, priests held prisoner by the Nazis in the Dachau concentration camp started a novena entrusting their safety to St. Joseph. The same day, Heinrich Himmler signed an order to execute all prisoners in Dachau. On April 29th, hours before this order was to be carried out, Allied troops liberated Dachau. The new Knights of Columbus produced documentary, Our Liberator, St. Joseph and the Priests of Dachau, takes a closer look at this incredible story. The film was released theatrically earlier this month and will be available to stream for free on Father's Day weekend at kfc.org slash ourliberator. Let's take a look at this inspiring new film. Oh. 
Adolf Hitler. Hitler and the people behind the, the regime believed that priests were one of the most dangerous groups in the Polish society. One of every two Polish priests were martyred in Dachau. And yet they turned to the man who was so patient himself as he fulfilled his mission, St. Joseph. These priests showed tremendous courage. Despite being tortured, showed a great interior strength. Inside the Nazi concentration camp at Dachau, St. Joseph stands as a sign of hope to the truth that faith and love can overcome even the greatest of evils. Each month, our Supreme Chaplain, Archbishop Laurie, presents a reflection and challenge for Knights to live during that month. The Supreme Chaplain's monthly challenge is a great way for Knights to put perseverance into practice and grow in faith and fraternity. You can always find each month's challenge at kfc.org slash monthly challenge. And here's Archbishop Laurie to issue his monthly challenge for June. My brother Knights, for my Supreme Chaplain's monthly challenge for the month of June, the scripture passage comes from the gospel reading for the Mass on Sunday, June 18th. At the sight of the crowds, Jesus' heart was moved with pity for them because they were troubled and abandoned like sheep without a shepherd. The gospel read at Mass uses the word pity, but other Catholic translations use the word compassion which means to suffer with. You know, when we suffer with others, we are naturally moved to comfort them. We are motivated by love to relieve and redress their suffering. In sharing the suffering of the afflicted and aiding them in word and deed, we demonstrate, bear witness to the love of Jesus and thereby reveal to them the face of of the Good Shepherd. For the month of June, I challenge you to show compassion and Christian charity for others by serving the poor, the sick, the lonely, or those in need in a direct and tangible way. Second, I challenge you to aid in the Faith in Action Global Wheelchair Mission, Habitat for Humanity, or Helping Hands program. As you undertake this monthly challenge, I ask you to reflect. Does the plight of others move you? Do you see suffering and perhaps go about your business? Or are you moved to provide genuine assistance? Do you pray for others who are suffering? God bless you as you undertake this monthly challenge. Vivat Jesus. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Nightcast. Once again, you can find all episodes at kfc.org slash nightcast and on the Knights of Columbus YouTube channel. Also, if you have thoughts, suggestions, or comments, we'd love to hear them. Just send an email to nightcast at kfc.org. Thanks again for watching. We hope you can join us for the next episode of Nightcast. Vivat Jesus.